document from Twitter, which I'm putting together arbitrarily, but that's just because we have got so many we want to get through, and I also want to hear your views on economy as well. How will your party tackle the vast inequality which exists in London, and related, London has the highest rates of child poverty in the country. How will you tackle this? Mark Reckless. Well, first we will take people earning minimum wage out of tax entirely. You should be able to earn up to around £13,000 before you start paying tax at all. Uh, secondly, we would, uh, we would do away with the bedroom tax, which my party considers an iniquitous when there are not the smaller properties that people uh, could move to. Why did and you vote for it? Uh, because in... <laughs> It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. I, I've, yes. always, um, <laughs> I, I, I've always, I've always seen arguments. I, I saw arguments on, on, on both sides of it. But do you regret voting for it? If though. I can answer, um, I think I do sli slightly. Um, slightly. <laughs> I think, um, Chuck, I don't know about, about you, but in my area of, of Medway, the, the, the council, I think, has done a very good job with a, a hardship fund where people who've had particular problems, I've seen as the MP, they want a carer to, to share with them, that they have a joint custody and they're not allowed to have their child come with them, or how they're having to spend money they simply haven't got. In almost all those cases, the council has actually been able to help them with a hardship payment, but they feel as if they're going to ask for charity for something that should be theirs of right, and that's why I've changed my mind and I do not support the bedroom tax. And how would you tackle the vast inequality which exists in London? Well, as I said, we would take people on minimum wage out of, out of tax and we would tackle the situation where for many people in our country the minimum wage is fast becoming the maximum wage. And I'm afraid the situation is, if you allow employers to take as many people as they want <laughs> from countries with far lower wages than we have in this country, then it is very, very difficult for people in this country to get, a, to, to get on the career ladder, to get a wage rise, to increase how well they're doing, if always the employer can bring in this competition for people who earn much, much less in their home country and are prepared to give them their due to work extraordinarily hard for minimum wage here. And that is a very, very difficult situation for people who have to compete with it. Lynn. I think um, one of the most important things is the, the what's happened in terms of jobs. When the Labour government left office, there were over three million people unemployed. That's changed, and in London, although we no, still there weren't. What? There weren't over three million yes, people unemployed. Yes, there were unemployed. over three million. Yeah. And no, we've been, no, not in weren't. London, no, I'm Just talking, ask James Ashton, the Evening Standard Session Economics the, correspondent there. I'm talking about the whole country. But unemployment in <laughs> London, unemployment in London, if you want to talk just about London, um, has come down, has come down by, by a great percentage. In terms of inequality, which I can't actually remember, as you can tell, um, in terms of inequality, the key things are, as I mentioned in my opening statement, the raising of the tax threshold, which takes people out of tax by, by 2020, 12,500 before tax, which is virtually... Do you actually want to narrow the gap yes. between the richest and the poorest? Is that part of your party's policy, is actually to narrow the gap? It is, and if you look at for something like, say, women's pay, where the gap has narrowed, I mean, up to 40, it's more or less even, but it's still over that is 9.4% difference. We've said that companies have to publish the pay gap. And if you can imagine um, a piece of paper uh, and uh, 25, 50, 75, 100,000 pounds salary, and if you have all the pink dots for the girls and they're all down there, and all the bl black blue dots for the boys that are up there, then I, that's actually a good answer to a question I didn't ask. I mean, that is actually good to narrow the gap between men and women, but I really meant narrow the gap okay, in terms so of wealth in London, because the inequality is what we're talking about. Well, as I'm saying, jobs are one of the answer in terms of raising it. The minimum wage will rise anyway to £8 by 2020, and we have, we'll ask the Low Pay Commission to see, work with employers to see how far we can take that minimum wage. Chukamuna. Well, it's funny. Lynn, you were talking about the pay gap between men and women, and yet you've erected these awful employment tribunal fees which prevent the women in this room, if they're not being paid the same as men in the workplace, from actually being able to do anything about it in a court of law. That's a disgrace. An absolute disgrace.
No, no, what, look, what we need to do is never mind, and we will get the minimum wage to beyond £8 over the next Parliament, but we've got to incentivise employers to pay a living wage, a wage that you can actually live off in London, which is why we're going to give them tax incentives to do that. And yes, I welcome the fact that there are more people in work in London now, but what is the nature of that work? We've got 1.8 million zero-hours contracts in this country. We've got 1.3 million people who are working part-time that want to work full-time. We've not only got to get more people in work, we've got to make sure actually the quality of your job is decent as well. And you can't ignore that. 80% right, yes. of new jobs are skilled and waged properly. Right, yes. Well, look, in a, in a super city like London, you end up with a huge wage uh, sort of gap simply because you end up getting people who are incredibly well paid in the city where we are and elsewhere. And what really concerns me are the number of children, therefore, for example, who live in absolute poverty. And that is where the untold story of this government has been a reduction across the country in 300,000 fewer children who are growing up in households uh, in uh, poverty, which is an achievement in itself. The second achievement, which most people will not know about and you will probably have not heard about through the media, is that in this country, for the first time in generations, there are fewer children growing up in households where there are no parents in work. Now that actually makes an enormous difference to a child's life, their success of school, at school and their potential uh, for their own future. But there are many other practical things. Uh, Chuk has quite rightly mentioned the uh, living wage. Uh, the accredited living wage, the number of companies who are providing the accredited living wage back in 2008, for example, with just 27 country, companies in the whole of London. That figure is now 500 companies and the Conservative aim is to see that grow because we believe that paying a living wage, that's over over nine pounds an hour uh, is much more suitable for a city like London. And finally, I'd say things like the cost of living, cutting the council tax, something that Boris has um, done uh, in London, but also creating the new jobs. Over half a million more Londoners, more jobs in London, uh, and actually over 600,000 more Londoners, uh, 600,000 more jobs, half a million more in those jobs in London alone is something which actually in itself lifts people out of poverty. And what about the question of zero-hours contracts? Well, look, zero-hours contracts which are abusive have to be banned, and that's why we passed a law which bans, for example, exclusivity in zero-hour contracts. But the but figures, minute, the figures, the fi if the zero-hours contracts are ban bad and you want them banned, that's it? Just ban them full stop? No, no, look, here's the thing. 2.3% of all contracts are zero hours. It's 700,000 people is the actual figure. 300,000 of them are people like students, some older people who actually want the flexibility of them. I had a charity in my constituency come to see me the other month to say, if you or the next government bans entirely uh, zero-hour contracts in an inflexible way, then our charities will close down. But it should simply zero won't be practical be banned to operate. after you've worked for a company on zero-hour contracts for more than six months? Yes. Well, look, it should be up to the employee to decide if they want that kind of flexibility, but, but we have to make sure that they no can't power. abuse people. But sometimes people... the employee has no power, <coughs> Natalie. Um, well, I want to come back to um, the living wage and what the uh, speakers on either side have said. Me, is said. Chukka wants to incentivise companies to pay the living wage. I say every company should be forced, every employer should be forced to pay the living wage. If you work full time, you should earn enough money to live on. That should be a principle and pro rata. Well, well, look at the actual returns of this. In terms of the Treasury for the government, this actually brings in more than two billion extra pounds a year because you've got more tax and national insurance and you've got less housing benefit and family tax credit. If you look at the Resolution Foundation did a study that said there'd be tens of thousands of extra jobs if everyone is paid the living wage. And I think I also want to, we started off with a question about inequality and I'm gravely concerned about the level of inequality in London and across Britain. And that's why we want to, among other things, bring in a wealth tax so that people who are worth more than three million pounds pay two percent of that every year in tax. So and I think it's your worth wealth tax and Chuka's got his mansion tax. Uh, so what I, it's worth saying this isn't a penalty, this isn't saying you're penalising you for being rich. Right. The richer people too, you live in this society, you get better public services, you get more in dealing with inequality, you get more economic stability. This is a positive that you pay in for and get a return. Now, there's a hand, I think there's a hand up there with the mic and a hand up without the mic. Can you, if you've got the mic, can you speak out, please? Someone's got the mic up there. Just in terms of... Yes, and the lady behind you have it as well, but carry on, sir. Just in terms of Chuka's point on the access to justice of tri tribunal fees, will it be, then be the Labour government's uh, proposal to scrap tri uh, tribunal fees entirely? Let's just deal 
straightforward, Ichuka, first of all, with the question of tribunal fees. Would a Labour government incoming scrap them altogether? I'd like to scrap them altogether, but I don't know exactly how much that will cost. So I've allowed for us to charge you know, very high-earning bankers, for example. We're bringing multi-million pound claims uh, more for their tribunal fees to ensure that middle and lower income earners don't pay it. Can I just go to that question, actually, just while you're with me? Look, I, I tell you why I have a bit of an issue with, that, uh, with the question that the lady asked. It, it, I don't like this thing that sets London up against the rest of the country or vice versa. Uh, I forget who mentioned it earlier about you know London being full of kind of latte drinking. Well, Fraser Nelson writing the Daily Telegraph. Well, Fraser, it was just a quick Fraser Nelson is totally out of touch with the reality of life for so many people who live in the borough that I have lived in and grown up in.